is for a late start. Unfortunately, our projector is not working. I called it in. I uh, don't hold your breath. It'll be here by the anytime soon, but I might be wrong. So I'm going to be lecturing the old-fashioned way. I'm going to write it on the board, which I think I still remember how to do this. So. And remember to bring my tripod, so this special edition of Chem 1105 with no projector will be on tape. Alright, I'm running late so I won't do it today, I'll do it Wednesday, putting more uh, chemical formulas, and that formulas the elements up on the board. Alright. A couple important things. One, everybody who's having lab this week, all of you, don't forget, wear proper clothing. You can't wear leggings, jeans, or any other type of pants with rips in them, especially big ones. Any of the, how should I say, fashion cuts or whatever you want to call them. You can't, don't forget to bring your goggles, not glasses. Also, the lab you did last week will be due either Tuesday or Thursday, depending on what day you have lab. And uh, uh, one other thing, uh, this week, if you have it already, bring your calculator to lab, because in lab I'll teach you how to use your calculator to use it with scientific notation. Now, since I don't have slides, I'll do the old-fashioned way. <coughs> Grandmother turned me off. Let's talk about chemical formulas. And chemical formulas is an important part of chemistry. It shows what elements are in a certain molecule. And I'll be teaching you later this chapter, next chapter, what's a molecule. So how do we write or show a chemical formula? We use the chemical symbols from the elements. Beginning of this chapter, I have another commercial. Don't forget to learn the 37 elements. I asked you to learn the chemical symbols for. But let's look at how we do a chemical formula. Now, symbol one, you just put down what elements are in the molecule. And this is sodium chloride. I'm not going to go through nomenclature now. That's how to name things. And you know it as table salt. And sodium chloride, the chemical formula is NaCl. Na is sodium Cl chlorine. And notice there's this one of them. So I know how many atoms are in sodium chloride? Two. One sodium and one chloride atom. You'll learn later on in this chapter, next chapter, um, what is an atom if you don't know, but I'll teach you. And as I think I mentioned once to you or twice before, if you ever go to dinner with me and a bunch of chemists or breakfast or lunch, one of us, and I've been guilty of this many times, will say, can you please pass the knackle? Knackle, never mind. Now, what happens when you have more than one type of element in a molecule? Most of you are familiar with this. This is the chemical formula for water, in case you forgot. And in German, that's Wasser. And I think in Spanish, it's aqua, but someone correct me. Hi. Give it your go. I shut it off and turn it on again. Yep, I've tried that already. Ah, I didn't know that was, let me get this out of the way. Is that the connection for the um, projector right there? Yes. All right. I guess you could do the obvious, pull it out and plug it back in again. While you're doing that, I'll continue. Anyways, this is the chemical formula for water. 
And notice when you have more than one element to the right of the symbol, there's a subscript number two. That tells you there's two hydrogen <coughs> and one oxygen atom in water. And now, if we look at this, we'll ask, I could ask, how many atoms are there in a water molecule? If you never wondered, two hydrogen, one oxygen. Remember, if I make a mistake in my addition, please correct me. And you have three. Now, let's look at another molecule. This is calcium chloride. Calcium chloride are those little white pellets you throw on the ice in the dead of winter to melt it when it's too cold to use sodium chloride. And I would ask you, how many atoms are in calcium chloride? That's for you to figure out. I'll give you 3.8 seconds to figure it out. 3.1, 3.6, my clock's low. Time's up, and let's look. How many atoms are in calcium chloride? One plus two, and that also has three atoms. And hopefully we've seen the, uh, the winter, I should keep my mouth shut about temperature of winter, and hopefully that will, we won't need that. Now, let's look at another example. Now, there's something called a polyatomic ion. And I'll teach you later what that is. And let's look at this. This molecule is called calcium hydroxide. Now, when you have a polyatomic ion, OH, and I'll teach you about hydroxyl later on this semester, and you have more than one of them, and since they're a unit, you put it in a bracket. And now everything in the bracket, we look at that and say, multiply the number subscript to the right of the bracket times what's ever in here. And that will tell you how many atoms are in the molecule. And let's <coughs> look at calcium hydroxide. It has one calcium, well, one oxygen, but times two, plus two, plus one hydrogen times two, so there are two of them. So that means there's five atoms. If I can write it correctly. And calcium hydroxide. And let me try, have you try this one. This is called magnesium bicarbonate. And the question is, two points, how many atoms are in this? Remember, you multiply the number of atoms here times this number if there's a bracket. Okay. I'm going to sit down let my assistant over here take over now. Just get scared of him now. Look out. The humor switches on. I don't think it's ever off. All right, let's take a look at this question is, how many at, wait, I see people still cycling. For those who never saw the Beverly Hillbillies, Jethro used to cipher. Instead of calling it addition or adding, they called it cipher. I just did a big generation gap thing on you people. All right, let's take a look. How many atoms are in here? There's one magnesium. Ooh, hydrogen, but it's in a bracket. The subscript is two, one times two, two hydrogen, one carbon, but times two, two carbon, ooh, three oxygen. It's in the bracket where the subscript outside is two, so three times two is six, and that's 11. And that's how you do come, oh, well, let's do a couple more, you can one. something most of you have in your kitchen. And that's sodium bicarbonate. And sodium bicarbonate you also know as Uh, 
By the way, I tried pushing the on buttons. There's a stick over there. You want to try it? It is on, right? It seems like the light bulb might be burnt out. So light bulbs burnt out, so we'll have to get a new one. That would be a good idea. If you can get it to this class, it's okay. If not, for next class, whenever you can. Thank you for coming out uh, prompt, so promptly. A burnt light bulb. I sort of knew that, but I wasn't sure. All right, let's get back to it. The question is, how many atoms are in sodium bicarbonate? How many atoms are in this molecule? This is sodium sulfate. Have you ever bought something, either electronics or optical, and they got that little package in there, do not eat? That's what's the material. This absorbs moisture, which is why they, moisture being water, why they put that in there to keep it dry so you buy it. How many atoms are in sodium sulfate? atoms are in sodium sulfate, let's find out. Sodium, two of them. Sulfur, one. Oxygen, four. And if I do my math correctly, oh, yeah. it's seven. And that's how you use chemical formulas. Remember the bracket. It shows you, you look at the number outside the bracket, you multiply with seven in here, times that number, in case of oxygen, there are three of them times two, six total. And that's a chemical formula, which we'll be using throughout the semester. Now, let's move on. And the next part, which you can't see this slide, talks about, I can't show it to you, the periodic table. Can everybody with this row see this over here? If you've got your book or your uh, laptop or whatever open, Go ahead and find a periodic table. Go to Google, put in periodic table. You don't even have to spell it. And the dynamic one is the same. Now, this is a periodic table. This is an amazing uh, development by Mendeleev. I think he was the one who came up with the idea. Others were working on it, but he was the first to really do it. And that is a way of showing the elements. And it's ordered by increasing atomic number. And I'll teach you later on what is atomic number. And it goes this way. And these are called the rows and the columns. Now, the rows are called periods, and the columns sometimes are called families or groups. Now, they're key groups, and I'll do it the old-fashioned way that you should know the name of that group, because they play an important role in our life. For good reason. Also, I will put it on the test. By the way, you can't see it, but
Once again, Dr. White's being subtle. All right, the first column, which includes lithium, sodium, potassium, and other elements, but these are the only ones you need to know, are called the alkali metals. I spelled alkali wrong, which I've been known to do. No, I got it right. Write that down in your diary. And these are called the alkali metals. And it's lithium, sodium, potassium. Now, if you look at the periodic table, you'll see above lithium, hydrogen. It's put there because of the atomic number, but it is not an alkali metal. Now, alkali metals are important. We use them. Um, how many of you have heard of lithium batteries? They're in your cell phones or other types of alkali batteries, mainly lithium. And this is an alkali metal. By the way, that's an A. Now, the next column is called the alkaline earth metals. I'll teach you, I don't know if it's later in this chapter, I think it's later in this chapter, what's the metal. And the two I asked you to learn from that are magnesium and calcium. And I just got back my blood test from the yearly physical I had last week. And the results showed my calcium and potassium and sodium levels were pretty good. My other things which I'll teach later in the semester were a little high. I've got to work on bringing them down along with my weight. So I'm not going to talk about that. Anyways, these two are the alkaline earth metals, and you should know. What it means by you should know it, on a test, if I ask two points each, give the name and the symbol of an alkaline earth metal. You could put down Mg, magnesium, because you'll learn those chemical symbol, or, or you could put down calcium. Now, if we go all the way to the almost completely right side, second to last column of the periodic table, and those are the halogens. And the halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. How many of you have ever heard the term halogen lights? Some of you have. You can get them car lights, which are those super bright ones. Or if you go into this, like Chicago, all the street lights used to be, even though they're changing them, some of them, at least in the suburbs, the LEDs were halogen lights. And that's because they contain a halogen which when you add electricity to it, gives off a very bright light. And those are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And if you notice, I don't have it on the board, but I'll put it here, sodium chloride contains a halogen. Now, the last column are called the noble gases. I believe named after Alfred Nobel, until about 1990s, give or take five years, they used to be called the inner gases until someone very sharp found a way to very, like, beat a hammer on, not really, but figuratively make these gases react. I mean, it was really hard, but he did. He won the Nobel Prize for that. And we can no longer call them inner gas, but we can call them now noble gases. That also has the neon. And that's helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And it should be a lowercase r. And I've worked a lot with argon. 
Neon, how many of you have ever seen neon lights? Neon lights have different noble gases. You put an electrical charge, they give off different colors in the tubes. I used to have a Schlitz neon light in my man cave when I had my own apartment when I lived in Chicago. I got rid of that years and years ago, sold to someone. And these are the noble gases. How many of you have ever seen the party balloons you can buy at stores that are real big? And they're filled with helium. And helium is also an inert gas. Or see, I said it's a noble gas. So you should know these for test one. If I say, and you'll be given a periodic table, unfortunately I can't show it to you right now, the one you have, but the first column of the periodic table are the alkali metals, and then the second column are the alkaline earth metals. Going over to the right, second to last is the halogens, and one all the way to the right are the noble gases. Ooh, I got it right. Usually I say inert, I did that one. Now, when we look at the elements, there are certain elements we've given other names to. You're familiar with these. One is metal. And what are metals? Metals are certain elements from the periodic table. And they have certain properties. And actually, I should have written it over here so I could spell it right. One of the properties is luster. Another is thermal conductivity. I'll write it here so I don't forget it from my slide. because I always spell that wrong and I already started to. And when we have a lot a metal, how do we know we have a metal? One of it is metals have the property called luster. Now what does that mean? If you rub on it, you can make it nice and shiny. If you look at this, if I were to polish my ring, it would be nice and shiny. It's still sort of shiny. If you take silver and polish it, it gets nice and shiny. When I was about eight or nine, that's when I got stuck with the family job of when company were coming over and my mother was taking out the good silverware and also the silver candelabras and the silver tray. It was my job to polish it, make it shine because it had luster. And one of the things my mother gave me, here's a toothbrush, get in the fine work of the candelabras and the tray and make sure that's clean. Oh, I hated that. But anyways, I did it because that was my job. Now, another uh, property of a metal is thermal conductivity. It transfers heat. If you go home today, wherever you're living, I assume they have a kitchen and you have pots and pans. Except for a number of years ago when someone tried to and it failed miserably on uh, making, selling glass pots and pans, they broke easy, and they don't sell, I haven't seen them for ages, all your pots and pans are metal because the heat from the flame or if you have electric stove is transferred through the metal to the food you're cooking. Another one is thermal conductivity, I mean electrical conductivity. And electrical conductivity means it will transfer or allow electricity to go through it. If we look in the wires up here for the lights in your cell phone, 
cable to my monitor, there's a metal in there, copper. And that helps. A better one is gold. And when calculators first came out, HP, Hewlett Packard, sold uh, calculators. And a big part of it is it had gold contacts and buttons, not the actual where you push, but the contacts of the button that made it, quote unquote, much better. You don't do that anymore. And examples of metal, which you should have a, be familiar with. These are not all, but these are a few. You should be familiar with at least one. And one of those would be aluminum. Back in the 40s, they used aluminum for wiring your houses, except they heated up and burned down houses. So for many decades now, and I know in Illinois, and most of the United States, not all, have zoning codes that you can't use aluminum for wiring in a house or building. Another one, copper. Platinum will cover uh, conduct, it's a metal. Iron, I think you know, is a metal. And silver and gold, and these are the metals. Now, we also have non-metals, which I'm turning the switch off. And those are elements that don't have these properties. They don't have luster. Oh, malleability, I forgot the last one for a metal. That means you can pound on it and make it real thin. How many of you have ever seen gold leaf or gold foil? Yeah? Oh my goodness. Sheltered light. But anyways, it's super thin. Almost like onion skin. Anybody ever seen an onion skin? This thing super skin. Are you familiar how they make aluminum foil? They run it through rollers to make aluminum thinner and thinner. If you look at aluminum foil you buy in the supermarket, one side shiny, the other isn't. Why? Because when they make it thin for what you're going to sell or you buy, and that's by putting it through rollers that press that make it thinner because it's a metal and it's malleable, by the time they get it to what you're going to buy, it's too thin to run it through a polisher wheels, which make it, because it has luster, make it shine, so they have two back-to-back -back when they run it through the polisher. And that way it won't rip, but the part that doesn't get polished is the parts that are back to back. And that's why aluminum foil you buy only has one side shining. Now, what does it mean to be a non-metal? Well, it doesn't conduct electricity, and you can't polish it, make it luster and shine. Example of that would be carbon. If you've ever seen a lump of coal, I'll let you try for the rest of your life polishing it, it won't shine. And uh, another <coughs> form of carbon is a diamond, this is not a diamond, do not try this at home. If you hit it with a hammer, it will fracture and crack, where a metal will get thin. And that's chapter two. Chapter 3, and this is still valid, and Chapter 3 is called the Atom.
Hopefully you can read it. If not, ask me what I wrote, what I printed it. What's an atom? An atom is the smallest particle of an element that has all the properties of an element. Now if you look here, I have a ring. It's made of gold. If I were to take, I could get one atom off. I really can't, but I could get more. And those atoms have all the properties, especially physical and chemical properties, of that element. Now if you look at the periodic table, every element is made up of atoms. And the more you put together, you got lots of atoms here. Water is made up of H2O, which are atoms. And everywhere you look except for the light, the light fixtures are, everything is made up of atoms, which are the elements that make things we use in our life. Now, how did someone come up with this idea? One of the great chemists in the history of chemistry, Dalton, and I'm going to turn the switch off for a discussion of Dalton. But it's still good to know about our past. And Dalton is a great uh, chemist, English chemist. And he came up with the atomic theory. Now, And the atomic theory had certain key parts. This was about 1800, 1810, which is only a couple hundred years ago. It's not that long in the history of mankind. And the first thing was elements are made up of tiny particles, which we now call atoms. Before this, I have some wild ideas going around. Another one of each element are the same. If I'm here and I have gold atoms, or pick your carbon atoms, silver atoms, and if I go to one of my favorite cities in the world, Amsterdam, I think I told you if you're not having a good time in Amsterdam, you know what that means? You're dead. But anyways, back to, if we go to Amsterdam, the atoms of gold there are the same as the atoms here in Glen Ellen. If I go to a city I've never gone to before, I don't know, uh, Peking or another city in Asia, say Tokyo, the atoms of gold there are the same. If I go to the moon, the atoms if I find gold will be the same. Now, atoms of other elements are different.
terms of different substances or the same can be combined to form, he calls them compounds, I think he used a term which you'll learn later on is still correct, uh, molecules, and a particular compound always has the same Another great idea he came up with is continuation that atoms, different uh, elements, can be combined to form molecules which always has the same number and type of elements. If I'm here, water is H2O. If I go to Mars and find water, it's H2O. If I go to the South Pole, and find water, which they do have, we call it ice, so far, uh, it's going to be H2O. And that was an important thing. And the last thing I won't write on the board, that when you change molecules, you can affect the change, and we call that chemical reactions, which you'll learn more about. Now, when we talk about an atom, there are parts of an atom. Talk about parts of an atom, we call those subatomic parts. Sub means under. How many of you know what a submarine is? Sub, under, <coughs> marine, water. It's a boat that goes underwater. And no, I will not start singing Yellow Submarine by the Beatles because it will ruin it for you. Even though it's a nice song, I like it. All right, now, when we talk about the parts of the atom, we talk about subatomic parts. And by the way, if it gets loud out there, feel free to close the door. First one is called a proton. And a proton has a plus charge. And that's why I have this. I can hear it. It's got to be loud. And it looks like they got the letter all ready to do the ball, which will now bust the name with the next batch. All right, by the way, electron. An electron has a minus charge. And the last one, which I often spell wrong, so I'm going to go peek on my chart. And that's called the neutron. 
How many of you are familiar with the TV cartoon program, Jimmy Neutron? If they had asked me to name that, I wouldn't call it Neutron. It has no charge. I would have called that them Jimmy Electron, because electrons are cooler than neutrons. Well, that's my personal opinion. All right. Uh-oh. I feel group participation coming on. And remember, the three subatomic parts are everybody. The first one. Oh, come on. It's not snowing out, no ice, it's warm. First one. Proton. Next one. Proton. Last one. Proton. Thank you. And you should know the subatomic parts. The first one is a proton, and you should know it has a positive charge. The next one is an electron and has a negative charge. That's why I have this minus sign. And neutron has no charge. Every element of the periodic table is made up of only these three subatomic particles, proton, plus charge, electron, negative charge, and neutron, no charge. And think about it, if you look around, we're all made up of subatomic particles. Can you see my electron show? Oh, I should show, no. But anyway, that was an awful show. But when you look at your skin, anything else, it's made up of atoms that make, I'll teach you molecules, and all those are made up of these subatomic particles. And you should know that the subatomic particles are pro oh, let's do it once more, one more time. Everybody, the first one. Proton. Second one, what's the feeling? Proton. And the last one. Proton. Thank you. I feel better in light of our dead projector. But I still remember how to do it. Now. When it comes to an atom, where are the protons, electrons, and neutrons? And that's an important question. I got five minutes to talk about that. And there's a great English chemist, Rutherford, and you should know the following.
And that means what we like. And I'll explain why Wednesday. But the nucleus is the center of the atom and it's very dense. And why was Rutherford's experiment so exciting and unexpected? And I was reading last night when I was looking this up to review it again. And he said when he saw that result, that was probably the most important thing that ever happened in his life. And the reason why is shooting these high energy particles at the gold foil and having them come back is the same as if I took a sheet of toilet paper or Kleenex and had a cannon with cannonballs and it shot it at the paper and it bounced back at me. That's how exciting and important this was. And he was able to deduce by that the concept of the nucleus. Also with that and further experiments, he found out that you should know, first of all, you should know gold, uh, Rutherford's gold foil experiment helped determine that the center of the atom, very dense, called the nucleus. And this you should know. <coughs> The nucleus contains only protons and neutrons. So in this very dense, small part of the center of every atom is the nucleus. And every element the nucleus contains protons and uh, neutrons. Electrons are around it, what we'll learn later on, is called the electron cloud. Now, how dense is the nucleus of an element? An atom of an element, if I had the nucleus the size of, say, a 16-inch softball, those from Chicago, I know about that, or a grapefruit, the electron cloud, where the electrons are, would go a mile and a half that way and a mile and a half that way. So the nucleus is very small, very dense compared to where the electrons are. And with that, I'm going to let you go. Oh, I want to hold 15 seconds. Thank you.